Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. I'm pushing the button. No. You don't know. You don't know what I've been through. You don't. You just use your words and you just just throw them out and they don't. You don't. That's not a. It's not a thing. <laughs> okay, man. Hey, whatever. Whatever. That's cool. It's called the bacon explosion. It looked like some sort of explosion. That is going on in you, do you now. To, do you want me to tell you? Do you want me to just tell you a little bit about it? If you didn't see the the uh, 
the trailer. Here is a nine minute uh, red band trailer. Uh, <laughs> That's a red band, even of of me and my 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 friend Ted uh, making the uh, bacon the bacon bomb. And so it starts with a pound and a half of uh, nice thin cut apple wood smoked bacon uh, woven in a mat like a lattice. Mm-hmm. That's about a foot by a foot and a half, uh, kind of rectangle. And on top of that, you take three pounds of, and we did a mixture of Italian sausage. Or actually, first we put a, a, a cherry wood pork uh, rub, like a powdered rub on the bacon. And then we put three pounds, we spread out three pounds of um, a mix of Italian sausage. And um, uh, we did just sausage and ground beef, and, and we put more rub and some barbecue sauce on top of that. And then you take the whole thing and you roll it like a Yule log, right? Mm-hmm. You're familiar with that tradition. Oh, yeah. Yule log rolling. And um, and from there, you so then you tuck the ends in, and it's this perfect like loaf of of like knitted loaf of, of meat. It's almost as if we uh we took uh, the all of the parts of, of the pig and we remade a pig out of it in just a different way. We repurposed all of the parts of, of it was it's horrible. With some and then cow we, mixed in. And then we covered it with <laughs> that's horrible. We covered it with uh, with brown sugar. And then you cook it low and slow. And you on on uh, on his uh, uh Ted happens to have a a very fine uh grill and we cooked it uh, low and slow for several hours and when it comes out it's this like beautiful like just deep mesquite red, um, crisp on the outside, fantastic on the inside, sausage on the inside, and you just slice it real thin, then you put it on sandwiches, or you just eat the whole thing whole. We didn't, we we shared, but it, it's the <laughs> it's the single best thing I, that I think I've ever seen done or partaken in uh, with meat. And I've done. I'm I'm not going to lie to you. I've done a lot of things with meat, things that I don't particularly talk about. That's fantastic. I want to try it. It's so good. It's so good. This is right. once you've uh, you just there's not a thing. And it's, it was getting somebody said on Twitter said that they, he's he's actually eaten it, and it was terrible. It's the worst thing he ever did. I'm t- that he did it wrong. I I call that man out. I don't know who it is, but I call him out. He did it wrong. This was a fantastic experience. Meat wow. experience. And to all Big you vegetarians out there and vegans, I'm sorry that I just offended you. I hope I didn't lose I didn't lose us any any regular listeners because of the horrible meatography that I I took part in this weekend. It's it's like eating a heart attack. I don't know. It's 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 paleo, right? <laughs> it's totally it's to, isn't it? It's like you're supposed to eat a lot of meat on paleo. Isn't that true? No, or no, you're not supposed to cook. It's like raw foods. I have no idea. I didn't eat it raw. I did not eat it raw. I guarantee you. I hope not. Uh, Credit credit for this goes to Patty Long's. uh, It's a Chicago bar that apparently made this thing popular about three years ago, and and uh, they did the good deed. I consider it a good deed of actually uh, sharing the process uh, with the world through Food Network and. I will tell you where I found this. I was actually on the treadmill at the gym. I was on the elliptical, <laughs> and I, I was watching, good place to do research. For I was watching. Like I was watching the Food Network, and what comes up? But this guy's search for the best bacon dishes in America. It's at Extreme. I don't know Extreme Kitchen. I or I just ate something twice the size of my head. Show and this was one of, and it happens to be twice the size of your head when you're finished with it. It's wow. great. You know, you know Merry who would Christmas. have been a fan, and if he were here today, may have joined you. Who? Tell me. Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> the, the man loved bologna. He loved. He not, loved his. He was at one of the his, list of people his, that I could come uh, up meat with. Meat that's terrible for you, but he who, loved it. I wonder. You know, I thought I didn't know where you were going to go. Milton Berl. No. Um, who else? <laughs> Judge Reinhold. Uh, no. <laughs> Go, oh, you know that's what we need to do. We've been planning this calendar for for the year. We've got all of our movies all set up, and uh, nowhere in them is a Judge Reinhold uh, film. Do well, you know that? we we've clearly got 50, need to go back and start fifty two weeks, and we have no Judge Reinhold. I think we should do. I think we should do a whole series of <laughs> Judge Reinhold and uh, Mini Driver crossover. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big list. 
I'm not. I, I'm not even sure that that's a list. But we should. Yeah. We should start the lobby. <laughs> let's let's send letters to both of their agents oh, and petition them. I. They we guarantee to... you a, a <laughs> podcast about that movie. Absolutely, get them will. together. We will podcast about that movie two years at least after its release. <laughs> uh, how are you, Andy? How was how was your uh, festivity? I'm sure you had a festivity over the weekend. It was festive. Yeah. Did you ring Actually, in the new it wasn't year? Festive. Did you stay up till midnight? I, I, I Did lied. you stay up it till really midnight? Really wasn't. I was trying to make it sound better than it was. Did you stay up till midnight? <laughs> it it ended up being uh, my son got really sick and had a bad fever. So we scrapped our plans to go out with our friends. And then later in the evening, my daughter started feeling sick. And then my wife started feeling sick. So they were all in bed by 10 o'clock. So I enjoyed uh, ringing in the new year, uh, watching American, uh, uh, American, what's it called? American Gothic? I just totally blanked on the name. Whatever that show is that I'm watching. American Horror Story? Horror Story, yeah. Thank you. Oh. American Horror Story. I don't even know. That's that's how that's really bad. meaningful it was to me. I'm sorry. But I'm really it was relaxing. Sorry. So, you know, you can't go, you can't argue with a relaxing ringing in of the new year, I guess. That's the truth. It's that's not like truth. I was, you know, getting a ticket or anything. Oh. I get, you know, I got pulled over in my own driveway the other day. That's a really bad drive. Because I didn't I didn't <laughs> I I didn't use my turn signal to turn into the driveway. Well, and I get pulled over my own driveway. That's like a little bit overzealous police work. I appreciate everything they do, I really do. But that may be a, a, a been a little bit overzealous. They uh, are really trying to meet their quota if they're pulling people over as they pull into their driveway. They didn't even get a ticket. That can't be part of the quota. Pull people over and let them go. What kind of police was he work like is that? staked out behind like some <laughs> some trash cans or something? I, I don't I don't know. I didn't even see coming it. into the neighborhood. I didn't even see where he came from. For all I know, he'd been following me for miles. Wow. All right. Should we talk about a trailer? Oh, we should do the. You need to uh, do the uh, details about the show. Where can you do the thing? Are you ready? Do you have it all ready? Well, people can find me at uh, on Twitter at Soda Creek Film. And they can find me at uh, over on Facebook at Soda Creek Film, and they can find us on the next reel, a Facebook page. And they can also <laughs> they can also email us at show at the next reel dot com, and uh, our phone number. They can give us a call and leave us a message, and uh, we just might read it on the air. Our, or play it on the air, excuse me. The The phone number is 657-201-REAL. That's 657-201-7335. Well done. Now I, I, you have one more thing that you need to say. This was part of our New Year plan, and you get to go first. Do you remember what it was? A little surprise? No, see, this is why we talk about the plan before we start recording. <laughs> you emailed me, and you now say we have to do this thing every week because somebody wrote in, and they wrote you and said that, they had they had to stop listening to to an episode because we were spoiling it. Yeah, they were well. They they just wanted to know where we stood on spoilers. Right? We because, stand uh, firm on spoilers. They they don't like listening to shows that have big spoilers pop up, and so they wanted to uh, get a sense as to where we were with the spoiler issue. And since we do tend to kind of you know cover films all the way from beginning to end we we figured that we should start uh talking about it and uh and make sure people are aware so and, there you have uh, it and, and it's it's so yeah yeah welcome to the next reel everybody <laughs> we will spoil this film that's right that's our that's platform right, yes i'm going to change the tagline on the website <laughs> come here the next reel we will spoil your movie that's right you know, I've decided uh, this evening, uh, in honor of uh, we're in the middle of our Catherine Bigelow. We're going to start the trailers in a minute, but I just want to. I just want to. Uh, I've decided that we're, I'm going to um, celebrate in honor of our Catherine Bigelow, Catherine Bigelow series. I'm going to read just at random throughout the conversation uh, Catherine Big Bigelow's tweets. Fantastic! Okay? All right, so I, I'd like to read the first tw uh, tweet from Catherine Bigelow. How long has she been tweeting now? Oh, uh, since um, August uh, 20th, 2011. 
And okay. so, so, uh, so she's had a, she's had a decent amount of time to get some tweets in. She has. All right. And so this uh, from this is a quote from the great uh, uh, American director Catherine Bigelow, October nine, two thousand eleven. Such a beautiful day today. So grateful. How was everyone's day? Wow. That was Catherine Bigelow, October ninth, two thousand eleven. Wow. She's a poet. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know. She's no, I well. no. I think that you're going to see uh, as we as we peel back the uh, the layers of the Catherine Bigelow Twitter onion. You're going to see not only the depths that we can plumb uh, Catherine Bigelow's um, you know professional work that that is laid out bare for us in Twitter, uh, but also the real uh, sort of uh, subtle influence that Twitter has had on uh, the culture of cinema. So. What trailer would you like to talk about this evening? This evening, I wanted to talk about The Place Beyond the Pines, a new uh, oh. trailer for a crime drama film uh, directed by Derek C. in France, who, uh, who went to school in Boulder. Oh, am I? this is one I'm supposed to know, right? Or not? Yeah, we, we, I, I told you to yeah, watch yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Minutes before we started talking. That's did right. You watch no, it? no, I, I didn't. I didn't actually do that. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're gonna have to film me. You know what I did? I watched the trailers I'd already seen today, and while oh, you, you were, while you again. were watching That's... them, yeah, that was good. So oh, tell yeah. me what you think. Yeah, you know, uh, Derek C. in France uh, did Blue Valentine before this, which was one of the most depressing films about a relationship that you could uh, watch. It really, really is a downer, but it was a powerful film. Uh, great performances by. Uh, Ryan Gosling and Michelle Williams in that one. This one also has Ryan Gosling, as well as Bradley Cooper, um, who else is in it? Uh, Ray Liotta and Eva Mendez, and uh, and some other people. I think Rose Byrne is in it. Uh, looks like a really interesting uh, crime story that deals with fa- father son relationships. Uh, both Ryan Gosling, the criminal, and uh, Bradley Cooper, the cop, have. Uh, have young children and are kind of dealing with their careers and the the decisions that they make and everything. It looks like a really great, great film, and I'm very excited to watch it. Excellent. I, too, am excited to watch it. I'm going to watch the trailer as a result of, of that uh, exquisite <laughs> Excellent. Uh, review of the trailer. Um, I, I'm actually, I guess I'm a little bit surprised that you picked that one. Uh, no, no, totally. Even totally after not, you, you saw... shouldn't be. I no, I mean I'm glad. I'm not no, it's no offense, man. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Wow. Wound up. No, uh, I yeah. just feel like you just we just watched um uh Dead Man Down. You had your list of trailers and I thought I didn't want to intrude. No, no, no. I, I this was had you done this, I would have done something else because you know I'm excited about other movies. But I'm gonna say uh I like Dead Man Down, but I think uh it, you know, I'm torn between the um the the actual trailer of Dead Man Down or the trailer of the trailer, Dead Man Down, <laughs> which I think both of them really uh, have uh, you know show some real, um, well it's a real twist to have that sort of back to back trailer. If you watch it on Apple dot com uh, slash trailers, you will see what I'm talking about. It's a trailer with a trailer. This is the uh, Niels Arden Opleff um, uh, film. It's an, uh, uh, an English language film, and I say that because the last a uh, film you likely know Niels Arden Oplev uh, from is the uh, is the fantastic original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. This yeah. film, Dead Man Down, stars Colin Farrell, Numi Rapace, Dominic Cooper, and uh, it looks like a funky kind of uh, a twisted uh, sort of a comic assassins beget assassins film uh, with a lot of things that blow up and um, uh, really, you know, really poor comedy. Uh, but a lot of great action. So it looks great. And I, uh, you know, it actually looks incredibly compelling. Uh, I've watched it three or four times today and, and, um, I think it looks great. Uh, but I'm glad that Niels Arden Oplev was able to, uh, <laughs> you, you kind of have to throw in a lot of umlaut That's when totally you dead, say that right. name. Uh, I'm glad he was able to, uh, you know, get an, uh, you know, an English language film out of his, uh, dragon tattoo film. Yeah. So uh, hopefully it'll help him kind of 
catapult and make a career for himself over here. Although I'm sure he's also having a great career over in Sweden, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing the wrong with Hollywood. that. <laughs> that there's is Hollywood, true. Bollywood, and then uh, I don't. You have to throw something with umlauts in there. That's right. Well, it's uh, it, it's fascinating to see uh, to sort of watch this uh, he did uh you know after since the girl with the dragon tattoo all he's done are, are tv sh- uh, tv shows mini series he did he did the uh obviously the the third uh, i don't know what the translation is mansom hatar kvinor uh men who hate women that was the that was the original swedish title of the was that the first or second uh millennium film I don't know. It's all in uh, Swedish, yeah. but anyway, in 2010 they did that originally as a, a TV series, uh-huh. um, and so what we saw as uh, Netflix films was, uh, you know, two parts of those were done in as TV series originally, and then he did a couple of um, uh, Unforgettable. Uh, he did the pilot and two episodes of the 2011 series Unforgettable, which was another um, uh, that was another U.S. show. That was a CBS series. Would you say it was? forgettable <laughs> I, I you know i'm not gonna say i just will say i had to look it up yes yes uh, I, I did too with poppy uh, yeah poppy poppy montgomery. montgomery yeah so anyway it looks uh, you know it's good to see him do this movie and it looks like a big movie and that's that's i like that a lot uh, it looks great and i'm glad to see uh you know i was really disappointed when um uh see now i've closed the uh closed the stupid window Ah, uh, I was really disappointed when War Machine uh, switched. Dominic, uh, what's his name? I just read his name. Come on, Cooper. Yeah, when he left, and uh, uh, you know, Iron Man. Mm-hmm. I really liked him. It's Iron Man. I wanted him to put on the War Machine suit in the second one, and they switched him out. I don't know what happened in Iron Man Two. Oh, you're not meaning. Uh, uh, you're meaning um, uh, Terrence Howard. Right, right, right. Terrence Howard. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He uh, he was uh, his ego got the best of him. Is his... what happened, and uh, he was uh, wanting a lot more money and was was uh, uh, want, it felt like he needed to be getting a salary equal to uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Something like that. That's that's kind of the long and the short of what I heard. But I heard Terrence Howard's um, attitude. And uh, ego kind of killed his opportunity to be in Seriously? Iron Man, any of the subsequent Iron Man films. Are, so, by extension, you are telling me that Don Cheadle costs less than Terrence Howard. I guess so. Or they got greater so. value. The value proposition, the Don Cheadle value proposition, uh, was higher. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like the Cheadle. Don't get me wrong, please. No, he's great. He's but great. I, I got. I, I mean, they're both great. I love yeah. Hustle and Flow. Terrence Howard is a fantastic actor. He is a fantastic. Uh, so clearly, um, I you know I don't know. I don't know how much you know to buy into the the stories, uh, but that is kind of what I heard that uh, there were those issues. So. All right. Well, uh, needless to say, uh, go check out this film uh, uh, with uh, Terrence Howard. Yes. He's, he's not a good guy in this film. He's not a good guy at all. No, he doesn't look like he's going to be a nice one. And we're going to dump the other uh, trailers that we find interesting this week. We're going to dump those on the web. Uh, and uh, you can find those trailers at thenextreel.com slash blog. And we encourage you to do so. Definitely. All right. Let's jump it. Uh, and so uh, I would like to say uh, we're going to jump forward uh, in time a couple of months to December 11th, 2011. Again, this is Catherine Bigelow. How was everyone's day? That was Catherine Bigelow, December 11th, 2011. She really is concerned about the masses, isn't she? It's, uh, it really is. It really shows kind of the... Well, and that's that kind of leads us into this film, uh, don't you think? We're talking about uh, 2008's uh, The Hurt Locker. Yeah, 2008, 2009 is when it was really widely released. It did play in festivals in 2008, but 2009 is when it was officially released in the U.S., and hence that's when it um, was uh, receiving Oscars. I like to go with the initial release, as you know. Yeah. Like Zero Dark Thirty, the initial release is when it's going to be getting Oscars. But that was an actual release. Uh, you d- Don't even... 
It wasn't the Hurt Locker was not released in 2008. It played at film festivals in 2008. There's a difference. It doesn't count. Ask somebody who saw it at that film festival if they if they actually thought it had released. Well, they would be wrong. <laughs> the Academy is very particular. You have to play in a theater in New York and a theater in L.A. for one week <laughs> before the end of the year, at, at a minimum, in order to be eligible for an Oscar, it, except for foreign language films, which have their own funky rules. But that's right. that's basically uh, how it works. So playing at a film festival doesn't count. All right. Well, I'll let it slide this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Catherine, uh, thanks you. Let's. Uh, so last week we started with Strange Days. Neither of us, I think, I think it's safe to say neither of us had a really positive uh, review of Strange Days. Correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I do think it has you know a couple things that I like, uh, but that's yeah, that's it. So the bar I was. I don't need to watch the whole movie again to ever no. enjoy those couple things. No. <laughs> Right. The bar was set at a couple of things. Would you say that the Hurt Locker redeemed uh, the performance of Strange Days by delivering more than a couple of things? Uh, oh, yes. That you liked? I, I'm very excited to hear what you liked about this film. I, I, I just everything. I mean, it's, it's a complete 180 from, from the direction she really had been going with everything up until uh, now. And maybe the film... Um, Right after Strange Days, she did another film called The Weight of Water, which I understand is kind of a, a very small uh, film that uh, wasn't. It, it was released in 2002 in the U.S. Sean Penn, Elizabeth Hurley, Sarah Polly, Josh Lucas, Catherine McCormick. Uh, it's just kind of a very small, almost independent film, and and that I think was kind of the a bit of the turning point for her to seem like she was looking for something else, but. Um, but then she went back to K-19, The Widowmaker, which kind of was going back to her her action roots that she had been doing up until that point. When The Hurt Locker uh, came out, I think it was a, a quite a surprise, definitely for me. I mean, it, it was uh, K-19, The Widowmaker, uh, and The Weight of Water both came out, were released in 2002 in the U.S. The Hurt Locker was released in 2009. So there's a big chunk of time between these uh, these films. And it seemed to me that she really reevaluated what she was looking uh, to do in her career as a filmmaker. I don't know if that's true, but that's just the the sense that I get. Because the films that she had been doing were very... Um, action oriented and had just like these kind of over the top, uh, you know, just this action, uh, you know, style to it. Uh, Blue Steel, Point Break, Strange Days, and Near Dark, uh, even K-19, The Widowmaker. And then The Hurt Locker comes along and it it kind of was, it definitely still is an action uh, film, although I'd say it's almost more of a war drama with some action in it. But it almost completely dismissed all of the action stereotypes that she had been, um, you could say, burdened with in her other films. Or or perhaps you could say they were the strengths of those films, depending on, on your take on them. I know Point Break certainly has its, its fans, but uh, The Hurt Locker really dismissed those types. And she's actually even talked about how she really wanted to uh, focus on telling a true story and telling a story that actually dealt with real people in a real situation and never uh, had to rely on uh, any of those tropes that, that make an action film what it is. And because of that, it's, this story came out of, uh, for me, it came out of nowhere of, you know, real uh, modern day heroes in a, an ugly war situation. And, uh, you know the kind of the psychology of these people who who volunteer to serve in our military, and it was a fascinating story. I I really fell in love with it the first time I saw it, and I've I've been a uh, you know a my my uh, uh, little champion of it ever since. I guess it's a great film. It it is a a great film. I it's a great film, and it's uh, I find it interesting the way it. Uh, it kind of approaches the war through these three guys. Um, in in so many ways, this film and you know, check me if you totally didn't didn't feel this way, but I you know I I see this again as one of those films that is um, a, a serial 
right? Each of these sort of little stories, these little events that come together and make this uh, this kind of overall package. Like there's a story arc that you can easily see broken up um, in in a way that that uh, uh, brings a broader tableau as a result of of looking at them sort of discreetly. You know, there's the um, uh, and and I think that that makes uh, without this sort of large kind of uh, heavy-handed story arc like we get in, you know, in Strange Days where we saw three of them, uh, what we really have is um, this kind of unreal structural restraint uh, in a story that could otherwise have easily uh, called for great grandiosity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, because it's a war film. Yeah. It's very easy. I, I, I think when people pair war film with action director it tends to turn into a Pearl Harbor right. or a a Rambo or something like that, where it's, you know, you've got this very kind of uh, macho hero coming in and kicking butt. And that seems to be kind of the sensibility that for whatever reason, people feel, ha- you know, what you have to have when you pair that stuff together. Uh, I mean, certainly things have all, there's always been those war films that have looked more seriously at war, uh, you know, even going back all the way to like from here to eternity, but even like Saving Private Ryan and things like that. Mm-hmm. But there was something about this film that uh, I think just took it from even a, a little bit of a different perspective, and I, it it felt so much more psychological. Yeah, I think that's really the the piece that I was uh, I was getting to too. That um, that what we what we are seeing in you know uh, Renner's. Uh, character James, uh, what we're seeing particularly in the relationship between James and Sanborn, um, uh, and and how that relationship, the sort of roller coaster of that relationship, that that changes so dramatically uh, from um, you know one of of uh, great sort of frustration and conflict to uh, one of um, you know absolute team player um, construct. Uh, at you know over the course of a single day uh, is really fascinating to watch and and I think it was it was um, you know it was portrayed as as sort of big as this movie can be uh, in terms of the intensity of the events that that are sort of uncovering you know the 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 intensity of you know every single time he goes up against a bomb uh, James goes up against a bomb um, you know is handled actually with great delicacy that I found really powerful. Take, for example, the very first uh, scene, you know, where we lose uh, Guy Pierce. Uh, that's the the only sort of sequence we see Guy Pierce. He is the uh, the lead bomb tech in this um, in this three man squad, and they are they have the bot, and the the robot is going out and discovers a, an uh, an IED on the side of the road. And at that point, we see uh, Guy Pierce put on the suit and he goes out and he tries to defuse the bomb and uh, as he's you know running away they they see that there is a, in fact an insurgent and and the bomb explodes and and we lose guy pierce and that's how we introduce jeremy renner then we don't see bombs explode very often yeah uh it, and i think that is a that is of particular note to me that we see what could happen when the bombs go off that it can be really bad and you can lose a character that is you know you see guy pierce in the film and you think okay this is going to be a guy pierce movie mm-hmm. uh and they off him right in the first five minutes yeah. and and it changes the tone of things well it lets you know right away uh you know because he's he's so recognizable yeah. nobody is safe nobody is safe right the, these the stakes are way up here and i thought that was really well done that was really well done and in in so far as you sort of feel betrayed uh because you know guy pierce is a he's a good guy i like watching then, the guy on screen yeah, i even and, like and then jeremy renner like comes in and other than uh you know bit parts in other films beforehand he hadn't really had a lead role before this i mean this was really kind of his big thing he had been in uh you know 28 weeks later and the assassination of jesse james by the coward robert ford and and uh you know well, definitely in a good number of films but always in kind of more supporting roles this was really uh his kind of breakout role and when you all of a sudden replace guy pierce uh with jeremy renner it is a bit of a surprise and uh and you find yourself following 
a, a whole bunch of, of faces that are kind of familiar, but but aren't the stars that you're used to. And so it does kind of put you into a kind of a different state of mind when you're watching the film. No, it truly, it, it truly does. I, you know, I would add about Jeremy Renner. This is a, I, you know, this, this hit me today. I was, I was uh, reading up on the background of the film and, and uh, learned that one of the reasons that Catherine Bigelow um, uh, had cast him at this point was that she had seen his 2002 film Dahmer. Uh, ah, yes. Where he played uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. And as it happens, uh, luck of uh, you know living in the future as we are, uh, it is available to stream on Netflix. So I uh, watched it on my phone uh, today, and <laughs> that <laughs> <laughs> um, he did great in that film. Good yeah. job playing a really <laughs> creepy serial killer creepy guy oh creepy guy and and that movie made me reflect on on the um, you know some stories that you know maybe don't need to be made into movies ever <laughs> yeah, there guy. definitely are some of those. Yeah, there definitely are <laughs> but but it was fascinating to watch because first of all he looks like a, you know a kid and it's very very uh, uh, you know it's it, it's funny to see age on this guy because he ages young anyway uh right. but but he uh he, you know it was a, a very different sort of stature but to see him play this character that is so meek uh otherwise you know works kind of the the swing shift at a um uh you know at a chocolate factory and and um uh, uh you know stalks people in the in the the clothing uh stalks boys uh in in the clothing department of of his local department store i mean it's just a really creepy uh, performance and yet something in that performance um, sort of sparked uh, Bigelow to say that this guy could could play that level of uh, complexity uh, that he brought to uh, Dahmer's character in James. Uh, yeah. And it's it's even more interesting to go watch that movie after seeing um, you know Hurt Locker and and watch his kind of evolution as an actor. It's it, it's a you know it's pretty powerful stuff. Huh, interesting. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, watch a half sure. hour of it. Just give it a half hour. No, no, no. But... Give it give it a half hour. You don't even need to watch the watch it to the end. It's but it's it's a it's an interesting um film and it, it, you know, Bruce Davidson uh, plays his dad. It's a you know, they have a, a interesting kind of complex relationship. It's worth it's worth checking out. Oh, well. Just for streaming, just for I definitely a few will. minutes. Just for a few minutes. Yeah. In any case, uh, it, you know, my uh, to date, my favorite sort of water, modern war movie uh, is Three Kings. Uh, Which is a fantastic film. Right. Uh, that it seems to kind of get forgotten for some reason, but it is a really uh, amazing film that uh, David O. Russell made and mm -hmm. uh, a very interesting look at the war, especially modern warfare. Right. Right. But what's interesting about the Three Kings in comparison to this one, and this is why I find myself having to really kind of stand back and think harder about um, uh, uh, about um, uh, what movie are we talking about again? The Hurt Locker. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. I have like 800 tabs open. They all are. Uh. Anyway, the reason I have to sit and, and stop and think about the Hurt Locker is because of that sort of structural piece. In in Three Kings, you know, we have this sort of caper that that is kind of um, overlaid on top of of this war environment, and and here we don't really have that. Uh, and and back to that touch of delicacy, what Bigelow allows us to do, and through sort of writer Mark Bowl, uh, is um, uh, is really focus um, so closely on these three guys. That really they could be anywhere. That the the um, uh, but what they have done is allow this their location to be kind of the fourth member of the team, and that just sort of it just really um, it, it makes it such a rich, um, such a rich experience. I think. For me. Well, and that and that speaks to the interesting structure of the script that uh, that um, that we watch here in this film that Mark Bull wrote based on his experiences. Um, as an embedded journalist in the war, kind of watching all of this stuff and watching these these uh, bomb squads and 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 following them around, um, the script is really if you if you if you kind of break it down, it's not a typical you know structured Hollywood film. It's it's very much a 
it, almost an intimate character drama. You're following these characters, and they really are the ones driving things that happen in the plot more than uh, the story itself and, and the things that are happening in the story. Because if you watch the story, it's it's very sequential. It's very um, situation-oriented. You go from one situation to the next situation to the next situation to the next situation. They aren't directly tied together. It's not like they're getting clues leading them to something. Sure, that ends up happening in the last act of the film, but it's not... Um, it's it's never really kind of a driving force across the entire story. It's always about the psychology of the characters and their relationships with each other, particularly, as you said, Sergeant James, Sergeant Sanborn, played by Anthony Mackie, and Specialist Eldridge, Eldridge played by Brian Garrity. I, I think it's the second, uh, the second James bum uh, diffusion, right? Is that the one where he picks up the chords and... Uh... That's Seven James' bombs. first one that, that we see first? him doing. Okay, after Guy Pierce's experience. Okay, so that's the that's the one that that allows us to really kind of cement the relationship between Sanborn and James, and I think that that that's a uh, that's an interesting one to take apart because first you you have him in the suit, uh, he gears up, he's in the suit, and then he takes the suit off when he discovers the the. Um, oh, that was the car one. Right? Yeah, that's it takes the car. Off, that's the you're second talking one. About the, I'm talking about his second, second diffuser. That's the one I was talking about. Yeah. So that's the one in the car. And and he takes off the suit, uh, and it ends up being more important to the relationship there and the kind of the, the conflict between these characters. Not that he actually dis disarms the bomb, right? That's a good thing. And the intensity, kind of the surface intensity, is... Uh, you know, amped up because the bomb situation is there and he manages to disarm it. Uh, but for their relationship, it's that he keeps distancing himself from the team. And that moment when he takes off his headset, his line of communication to these guys, he makes that tra transition between team player and uh, lone kind of lone hunter. And now his relationship is between it, it is strictly between him and the guy who made this bomb that he's now trying to to defeat, uh, and that ends up being an incredible setup for the way these guys work together and end up finding themselves again, uh, you know, through the throughout the course of the film. Yeah, and it, and the relationship between the three uh, primary guys that we're following is really it's it's a fascinating study because if you look at uh, James uh, Jeremy Renner's character. He is a guy who, you know, we kind of get through the quote at the beginning of the film that says, the rush of battle is often a potent and lethal addiction for war is a drug. Uh, it's a quote by Chris Hedges. Uh, we see that in him and how he goes through this experience almost just focused on the adrenaline rush he gets from these uh, you know, uh, experiences of defusing the bombs, taking chances that he probably shouldn't, uh, stepping into situations he probably shouldn't. And at the end of the film, when he's left lost at home, unable to, you know, even just handle shopping in the grocery store and be with his, his uh, you know, his ex-wife and child, he, he goes right back because that's what he's he's addicted to. He says, you know, we have one thing and that's this is his one thing. But then you look at how the war likewise is affecting Eldridge and Eldridge is a, you know, a mess. He's constantly in fear that he's going to die. And he's just convinced himself that, that he's not going to make it through this. And, and we see that through his conversations with his, with his, the doctor and how, how, the, how this story changes him in a way that, you know, he starts getting a little more confident, but then at the end, he's just like, you know, he's, he's, taken and shot and he's just a mess you know he really realizes that this whole thing is a mess and likewise with Sanborn who sees this uh what James represents and and Sanborn starts as a pretty confident soldier he's 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 you know a very gung-ho sort of guy but by the end of the film even he is just like you know I don't want to be here anymore I, I just got to get out of here and we see how he kind of loses all of his steam after being in this this world of of destruction that they're in and and how it just ruins things yeah uh 
Yeah, I, you know, it, it's it's um, uh, it's a funny thing watching the way these guys. I I think the way these guys come together in uh, through uh, darkness. And it, I kept thinking about Renner as Renner's character as James. Uh, it, we keep coming back to these same kinds of guys, uh, Driver, uh, Leon. You know, we've had this conversation before. Yeah. Where there are these guys who are exceptional at doing one thing, and they are absolutely incapable of doing anything else. Yeah. Right. Now you brought up the the sequence at the end where we see Renner's arc. You know, he ends uh, sort of at the beginning, uh, and to get there, he has to go home. He goes home and he sees his wife Evangeline Lilly, and he sees his son, and uh, you know she is fantastic. Uh, as briefly as we get to see her, um, you know she's fantastic as kind of the um, she she's the war widow. He's not dead, but he's not there. Right. Well, and he's she's an ex wife who hasn't moved who hasn't out. Moved you know, out. She's still but, living in the house. And but, but you know, you that's know, a, how do you for all I, intents and purposes, they're still having this relationship. As he says, you know, she's not dumb, she's just loyal. Yeah, but you know, how uh, by the time you get to the end of the film, uh, d- do you really trust him? Right? No, do you really no, trust yeah, that? Right. Like, I, you know, he, those are the words, but that's not the implication. When you see, you know, the level of kind of her, uh, you know, her portrayal of this this war widow, uh, but what was, uh, gosh, what was I saying? I was talking about the uh, the 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 grocery store scene in particular. Right. You know, it's this sort of clumsy trope through the uh, uh, through the grocery store, and he he doesn't know what what he wants to pick out. He grabs any any cereal uh, because he is so so out of his context out of his world that that he has to the only thing he gets and I, I don't know if it's that he necessarily loves it or that war is a drug uh, necessarily maybe it is I've, I've never been to war I can see how it could be portrayed that way or maybe this is a guy who is um, you know who is has found his skill and it happens to be in the context of war uh, well, and that's that's exactly it. Because as he's talking to his son about the the Jack in the Box, you know, he has that whole conversation about, right. you know, all these things that you love start becoming less important to you. And by the time you're my age, you know, that you're only going to have one or two. Right. And he says, you know, I only have this one thing, and that's yeah. his one thing that he that he does well that means something to him. And you're right, it does happen to be in the context of war. And even though he's put in these situations where you know he sees this young boy used as a, a body bomb and uh they're the, you know developing those attachments to him because of his own son even with that he still isn't able to stay home and be with his own son he has to go back to to doing the one thing that he can do and that means something to him well and look at that uh, look at his his sort of poor attempt to solve the crime right yeah. Uh you know, he tries to to leave the base. He tries to get out of his fatigues and and uh cross the city to to get information on how, you know, his how Beckham the boy would be, you know, taken and used as a body bomb and and that ultimately is unresolved. He's not Well, it, he he's not able to, but then it turns out that Beckham was wasn't the kid anyway. Right. But but you see his yeah. his inability to cope out of that specific context, any you know, even in war, uh, he he wasn't able to um, to you know he he was sort of impotent. Um, yeah. as soon as like he the left guy, base, the guy mistakes him as a CIA agent when he breaks into the guy's house. Exactly, it's, you know he 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 doesn't have uh, the sensibilities to be that CIA agent that would be able to uh, possibly solve that situation. Exactly, just throwing his gun everywhere, and he ends up being chased away by thrown pots. Yeah. Uh, which which I think just furthers that uh, uh, the the complexity of his character, but the simplicity of it at the same time. Yeah, uh, he's just that guy. All right. Uh, so the film was uh, filmed in. Uh, well, actually, we should, let's take a step back and talk about Mark Bolt. Uh, so he you already said he's a freelance journalist. Uh, he was embedded with the American Bomb Squad in uh, in Iraq for two weeks in two thousand four. Uh, and um, spun off uh, this story, working with Bigelow, uh, for this movie. 
what do you think of the, uh, you, we've already said we like the way the story is structured. Uh, what do you think of Bull's uh, general performance as a, as a screenwriter? You know, I, I know he's pulling a lot from uh, the real experiences. And I know there was a lot of controversy um, over, uh, you know, different lawsuits as far as, you know, stealing the story from uh, some guy's real life and all this sort of stuff. I don't know if, uh, I don't know how much any of that really um, affected the quality of the script. But I, as I said, it's an interestingly structured script. And I like the story of the psychology of these people as they journey through these different situations and how each situation kind of presents them with a different um, element. Um, within their psychological makeup that they have to deal with. I really enjoy that aspect of the story. And it, it, it flows so well. I was really paying attention to how sequential it seemed. And um, I, I think that he really wrote a masterful script here about these interesting characters and the way that war affects people. I, I think there's a lot to this story. And um, I, I, I think that he was deserving of of his Oscar for it. There was, you know, in addition to the controversy about the sort of the story, you know, itself and where the story came from, um, there was uh, the, there was some pushback. For, I don't know if even that's the right way to characterize it. There was some some pushback from the military community uh, that uh, what they portrayed this, you know, elite three man team. Uh, of of doing in the course, of, particularly of the third act, uh, is absolutely unrealistic. Right, right. In so far as Mark Bowles says he's building this account on real experiences, these experiences, the military experiences that were supposed to be um, sort of the um, you know core of this you know military, essentially military film, uh, were not true. So I I assume you read that as well. What's your it's, you what's know, your take? What's your take on that? How, so what, hard to say. Uh, does it? Does honestly, it? No, no, no. The, the question the is: the nature bigger. of film is you're telling a story, yes. and you still need to come up with a story that that does still have a flow and has a beginning, a middle, and end. And yes, you could, I guess, just make a, a very straightforward story exactly as it does happen. But is that going to be something that people are going to sit in the theater and watch? Is it going to have? Is it going to feel like you're just watching these sequences that happen with nothing tying them together? And I don't know if that's really going to going to work. The um, I I think I'm with you. I you know you watch this movie and and having never I mean I I've never been there. I and so I, I all I can say is I love I I love the film. I love watching the film. I love what you, you know the experience the film sort of brings me. Um, and you know, I, I, I can't say that I watched the end of the film when the three, you know, when the three men split up and say, we have to split up to cover more ground, which I think is one of the bigger points of contention for those who have been in the military or, you know, protective services or, you know, any sort of, um, you know, police, uh, that you, you don't, you don't really do that. That's not, <laughs> that's not a thing. <laughs> And so, well, yeah, a, and, and, you know, it's, then, it's, <laughs> yeah. if, if there is any action, um, trope that they're pulling, that definitely is one, you know, splitting up the group, which really yeah. is more of a horror thing. Which is really, exactly, it's more of a, more of a horror thing. But then I, I read this this quote on, uh, it's actually a quote Ebert pulled on his blog from uh, Mark Bowl in Vanity Fair, and I <laughs> think this passage is really funny. Uh, this is Mark Bowl speaking. A lot of people in the military have seen the movie because there are pirated copies all over Iraq. People saw it almost six months ago. A few people have seen it here in film festivals. So far, the response has been good, although I'm sure people will say that we got this or that detail wrong, unless you're going to make Transformers. I literally had a conversation with a guy who was telling me how realistic that movie, Transformers, is in its depiction of the military. I said to this senior military guy, what part of fighting aliens is realistic? And he replied with a completely straight face, if we were going to fight aliens, that's how we would do it. 
That's fantastic. And that's that's a, just fantastic. You know, that ends up being kind of an important point because the military gave exhaustive support to Transformers, uh, yes. including, uh, let's see, the list goes on Marine hovercrafts, Navy subs, nearly every kind of Army helicopter and Air Force plane in service from the Frisbee Top D3 Sentry to the retired SR-71 Blackbird, uh, all coordinated through a special arrangement with the Department of Defense, including all four branches of the military. That's Transformers. And this film, The Hurt Locker, received none. Yeah. I, uh, that, uh, I don't know if that's particularly telling, but, uh, you know, at least Transformers got the guns right. <laughs> well, we could talk Transformers, yeah. There's, it definitely <laughs> has, a, has its military love going on in that film. Um, but, you know, here's speaking to the point again, though, that we were talking about, People have to realize that this is a movie and it's not a documentary. We're not following real people in real situation. These are fictional characters doing things that aren't necessarily things that you should be doing. And I think that's kind of the point. When you get to the end and they do run off into the darkness uh, and down the three different alleyways, it, it, we're following fictional characters who are – are in a situation, you know, the, in this story, a fictional story, and they are, are, you know, doing things that, that fit within the characters as they're written. They're not real people. And so the fact that they do something like this, yes, it maybe it isn't realistic as far as what the military would actually do. Again, we're following these fictional characters. That's what these characters uh, decided to do for Better or for worse, that's the decisions they made, and obviously it didn't turn out very well. Yeah, you know, I I think it it gets to the to you know what Mark Bull was trying to do, and and has said you know on a number of occasions that you know the the character particularly of James, it's an amalgamation of of you know many characters and many you know real people that he uh, came into contact with in his time there, and um, you know from the perspective of writing these characters that are sort of these these amalgam characters right yeah uh you know you find that what may be realistic for one component uh for one sort of participant in that you know psychosis uh, suddenly is no longer realistic when you put all of the pieces together and uh while you know any individual that Bull was thinking about, uh, you know, when he was originally creating James. Once all of those characters get together in inside that single head, suddenly he's taken on a life of his own. As you say, it's a fictitious. It, it is a, a a fictitious story about a fictional character in a very real or realistic situation. Uh, and you know, sometimes what they do uh, is is not what would be necessarily protocol. And exactly. I, that that's kind of how I walked out of it too. It was just sort of giving. That's that's the one where I I I didn't know how I was supposed to feel. What and and I guess the conflict was, you know, are we supposed to look at this as a failure of uh, Bigelow for not sticking to um, the the tapestry of reality that she had so proposed to create, or are we supposed to see it as a, a you know kind of mad success of the the you know character actors who are putting together this. Um, this amazing story and delivering these complex characters in a way that makes their decisions real. And I, I chose for the latter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, I agree. I, I agree. All right. What else you got? Well, the, the film, this was a, uh, a very, a very uh, gr uh, beautifully shot film the the way that it was shot um i mean it, it's it's war film it's got a lot of ha uh, handheld uh cinematography um Barry Ackroyd was the uh, cinematographer for the film did a great job capturing a lot of the the heat and the dirt and the grittiness of of you know wartime in the summer in Baghdad did a really great job capturing all of that and um I think that we also need to point out a couple things is all of the amazing slow motion that they used, ultra slow-mo, really. They were shooting it on a phantom camera that shoots 10 to 20,000 frames per second, which is insane. <laughs> but that's how you get those amazing shots where when the bomb goes off and you get the slow-mo of the the rocks just like rising from the ground as the overpressure 
from the bomb blast, you know, just rips through the the area, or you get like the rust like rattling off of the old car on the side there. Mm -hmm. And it's they're beautiful shots. I mean, it really is a fascinating way to portray what these explosions were really like and something that they really strived to achieve um, switching from cinematography, but to the actual effects, they really wanted to try achieving um, a much better explosion because there always were so many complaints from military people about how explosions, they called them HMEs, you know, Hollywood movie explosions right. and how they always looked wrong. They were too, too much you know, fire and red because of the, you know, the gasoline that Hollywood uses in their explosions. So Bigelow and her team really worked to create these bomb blasts that were just black and dirty and full of debris um, and and smoke. And they really, I thought they did a great job. I mean, I've never seen a bomb go off, uh, but it looked like uh, a different type of bomb blast that I had seen in uh, virtually any other Hollywood film. And that paired with the amazing cinematography when you get into that ultra slow-mo works really well and really portrays what it probably would be like in a situation where you have this bomb blast that, that it's, you're, it's not just the fire or the heat or things you know, hurling at you, but also just this, the way that a bomb blast affects the air and they call it overpressure and how it just rips through the area. And that's it, like what kills Guy Pierce right at the beginning. It's just, it, it, the blast is so intense. It just knocks him out and basically you know, blows all the air out of his lungs and almost, you know, implodes him. Yeah. It's a, it is a stunning sequence. The, the sequences you point out, those phantom sequences and, um, and kind of the way they were able to capture, and this is what I thought was, was so wonderful that they used that technique, not as, at least I didn't feel like it was as a gimmick, but it was a way to capture something that otherwise you cannot see. Right. right, you cannot see like an energy wave, and I, I think she like the the vision for capturing when the dust lifts up off that car, when the the you know the particles of of grit and grime kind of float up off the ground, and you watch the you know you watch Guy Pierce flying through through the air. It is a stunning uh, way to open the film, and certainly way to capture those those explosions. What can you talk about the significance, if there is any, of the of the um, the other. Uh, technology they used to film this thing the super 16 um millimeter cameras they had four of these cameras um and um you know do you do you read up on on kind of how they ended up shooting this thing besides the use of the phantom is there anything worth talking about there you know i don't know if there's anything that much other than the fact that they were um they they used multiple cameras uh, Super 16, I would imagine they were because the, I mean, essentially, this was an independent film. They produced this. Uh, they Fully raised financed, their own money. Yeah. They found some foreign investors to to put money in, make this film. And um, because of the lower budget and because they were shooting in Jordan, uh, I would imagine that they wanted to get cameras that were cheaper to to uh, to rent that were easier to transport all of that and so that would be my guess as to why they they used the super 16s and four of them because they wanted to have a lot of different perspectives and uh, i would also guess because since they were shooting in jordan that way if one of them went down they still had other cameras that they were able to use um i i didn't read up on it at all but that would be my best guess you know uh, the uh certainly makes sense to me I'm, I'll, I'll give you that one Okay. Uh, the the thing that I found was interesting um, about uh, is is the editing process. Chris Innes and Bob Morawski, um, they ended up editing on location um, because of the uh, of apparent risk uh, sending their undeveloped film through extremely high security airports. Uh, where this the film would would very likely be open. So they you know I my adding to what you said you know taking that super 16 millimeter film um uh you know and and uh, editing on location and you know it probably makes it easier on a lot of uh in a lot of ways yeah yeah definitely it definitely would and, and it's a i mean i think a lot of films do edit on location nowadays um if they can when they're when they're shooting mm. on location overseas wherever right but um 
Oh, here, here's the here's the passage. Uh, accordingly, the film was hand carried on a flight by a production assistant from Amman to London. The Super 16 film was transferred to DV Cam in a lab in London. Video dailies transported by plane back to the Middle East, imported into the editing room. The whole journey takes anywhere from three to three days to a week. Described by Innes as the modern day equivalent of shipping via donkey cart. Yeah, that's just fascinating. You know, compare it's, you that know, to the, the Hobbit. things that filmmakers go through sometimes right. to uh, to make this stuff work out. It, and, you know, uh, I I, you know. I remember watching the uh, you know the Lord of the Rings dailies uh, were actually shipped on iPods. Did you see that uh, there was that, that making of a thing on YouTube? It was fantastic. I'll have to look it up. Where they actually show a guy walking down the street and he has all the dailies. On And it wasn't like an iPhone. I mean, this was an old rotary, you know, used this iPod as a hard drive. Uh, and all of the Lord of the Rings was on there. I just don't even know how much footage they could fit on one of those things. <laughs> I know, right? Not very much. No, maybe, maybe a few frames. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway. Um, okay. Yeah. So, you know, I think it, just in general, putting the way, the way, you know, when you talk about the four cameras, you really feel that intensity, and uh, oh gosh, what, uh, have you looked at the um, at the shot length uh, calculator on this? Uh, no, you know I didn't on the the cinematrics. Yeah, uh, we we'll put a link to that if we if it's in uh, if they do a let's look at the database. Let's bring it up and see what we have. There it is. Yeah, it looks like the average shot length is about three point four seconds. So it is uh, when you, they're in the middle of the, particularly in the middle of the um, of the uh, you know where they have the the guy uh, who is chained up with the uh, the bomb vest, yeah, uh, and he has to go in and uh, uh, and tr- attempt to defuse this and is ultimately unsuccessful. Uh, you, you can you can practically see um, you know the cameras at the compass points around them, uh, and uh, it is very frenetic. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, it really is. Uh okay. So the movie, uh, as we said, it was financed by um uh, by the filmmakers. Oh uh, well yeah, they found some independent mm-hmm. uh film uh financing overseas somewhere. I'm not right. I'm not sure where they got their money, but you know, some 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 rich people overseas ended up uh, costing them. What did what did it end up cost them? Uh, uh, I see that it cost million? them fifteen million uh, to get it made. I see that the uh, the total budget was nineteen million. So it doesn't look like they had a lot of money for uh, marketing. It looked they they probably used a lot of the um, just the buzz that it was getting in all the festivals that had played it in two thousand eight uh, to kind of carry it. And then it made fifty. Yeah, it did okay in the states. It actually only made about seventeen million, and internationally uh, about thirty-two point six million. So total, it was about fifty million. On a so, fifty yeah, million then, budget, not bad. You know, the DVD sales have been pretty good, almost thirty-four million, and so it's it's uh, making its money. It's it's a funny thing that we are talking about this movie. Like this is this is uh, let's see in my you know I think what do I have it in my my flick chart? I think it's at thirty, maybe it's thirty. Um, twenty-eight. I've got it at twenty-eight on my my flick chart, personal one. I I really like this movie. I really really do. Um, I I think it's terrific. And when we're talking about the budget and the and the box office, it really surprises me that those numbers are kind of actually as low as they are. Like this is a movie I feel like should be seen by more people. Yeah. Right. I mean, does it? I. I it 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 definitely feels like. Uh, a film that, for whatever reason, just didn't. Uh, it got all the critical attention, but it just was something that uh, didn't draw people in. I think again, it boiled down to the structure of the story and how it's much more of a character uh, psychological portrait sort of film than it is a a typical Hollywood war film. If it had been a typical Hollywood war, war film, yeah, it probably would have made tons of money. As it stands, yeah, yeah. I think it. You know, uh, I think Entertainment Weekly did a an article a few years ago about um, Oscar the films that have won Best Picture, 
and how much they actually made. And I think this is one of the lowest grossing best picture winners in the last uh, or, or since since the Oscars have been around. I think this and Crash were the, the two lowest grossing uh, films that uh, won best picture. Mm. It's such a shame. And, and you know, I think uh, Catherine Bigelow tweets uh, would support that on January 27th. She said, um, apropos, lunch with friends in the valley. Catherine Bigelow, January twenty seventh. So I think you know you see that that kind of she that that really uh, bears out. Yeah, yeah. She uh, sells it. Where does this sit for you on on Flickchart? How's this rate for you on your top one hundred? Tell it me, it's made well. the top one hundred. Well, I I don't know right now because I'm not logged into my Flickchart. I'm logged into oh, our Flickchart. So into our chart. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you. All right. Uh, did you and and before we jump directly to that, I am uh, curious if you uh, uh, did you look at the the new spreadsheet for this one. The new the, spreadsheet, the, the spreadsheet the that we've spreadsheet? been talking about, the budget spreadsheet, the finished minute. I have it on here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm bringing the it Hurt up right Locker. Now. I, we did a new uh, spreadsheet for the cost of films, um, uh, and then breaking it down into their per minute. Uh, how much they cost per minute and how much they made per minute. And the Hurt Locker uh, cost, I said, $15 million with about $4 million for for uh, prints and advertising. So the budget per minute was about $145,000. And with, with making nearly $50 million, the gross per minute, $379,227. And total profit per minute was $234,189. And uh, let's see, for uh, for perspective, that beat Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, did a, beat, it did beat out Shaun of the Dead. It beat Shaun of the Dead, yes, but not did. quite. Thank you for smoking. It turns out it's uh, Hurt Locker is at number 41 uh, on our uh, next real movie cost per minute breakdown. It helps. It helps to have a longer movie. Shaun of the Dead's only ninety nine minutes, and and even though it only costs twelve million to make, that uh, it doesn't get spread per minute quite as nicely. Yeah, we, just because this is kind of a new thing that we're just doing, and we're going to publish this spreadsheet. I I haven't right. We're, that's our plan. We're going to put it a link somehow. To show. Yeah, we have, we'll, we'll, I don't know how to publish a you right, know, so an active spreadsheet, but we'll figure something out. We've we've got that. We're gonna we're gonna publish this on the site, so you can go check this out. Uh, you know, um, Andy's working. I think we've got uh, Sarmento's jumping in and working on this because he's. He's a another data guy too, and I, you know, in our exchange in email, uh, uh, we, you know, you, uh, you discovered something that was just plain horrifying, and I think I would like you to, I would like you to to say it. <laughs> of all the films that we've talked about on our show, starting, uh, you know, well, this is episode. What is this? The sixty first film that we've discovered or discussed? Oh, yes. Yeah, of there. all of those films that we have talked about. The film that has made the most money per finished minute of the film, and I know this is kind of a silly way to look at at grosses, <laughs> but it's fun. The number one film is Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, <laughs> which made a profit per minute of four million three hundred fifty-seven thousand thirty-four dollars. Oh wow! Yes, and and people wonder why Hollywood keeps turning out more and more. Well, and look at the top. Of, uh, look at the top. Bad big budget films. Look at the top that five. That is why Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Crystal Skull, Jaws at number two, at three point six million profit per minute. Raiders of the Lost Ark at number three at three point one million profit per uh, per minute, and uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom at two at uh, two point four. Yeah. Uh, un real money in this business so it sounds like we're on the wrong side of the uh wrong side of the business that's what i'm gonna say definitely definitely uh what else do you have you've always got something what's your thing just um you know to the authenticity of this film i found it really fascinating that they made this in they started shooting mid-july and uh, they shot it in amon jordan and uh, Jordan in the summer is uh, as hot, if not hotter, than Phoenix, Arizona. And they were shooting this when the temperatures were, uh, the average temperature, I think they said, was 115 degrees when they were shooting. And poor Jeremy Renner and Guy Pierce 
both had to wear that that suit that uh you know the suit that's you know they call the hurt locker um not that they say that in the film but that's what the title of the film is referring to the suit that they wear and that suit is 80 pounds it's an 80 pound kevlar suit and these poor actors had to act in an 80 pound kevlar suit in 115 degree temperatures and i tell you i just i got a feel for them sometimes i think some of the things that actors get to do are are uh, amazing and i would love to partake and then there are stories about that and i just don't think i'd want to be in that suit in that temperature i've been in that temperature in very light clothing and it's horrible i can't yeah. imagine what those guys were going well through. and and you know i was thinking about that as you're watching that you know watching guy pierce and watching jeremy renner and then in those suits and even even just not in the suits just in straight up you know fatigues uh the, these guys they they look really good you know what i mean and, yeah. and i say good they they look you know they look like they're they i i don't know if i <laughs> i don't know i not acting in front of a camera i don't know if i could convince you know uh, anybody that I was, you know, being able, uh, I was able to be taken seriously in that kind of heat. I just, I, I just couldn't do it. I'm not, yeah. I'm not wired for it. They did a fantastic job. Uh, from what I understand, they absolutely hated one another. They were having a horrible time. <laughs> that was very <laughs> difficult. Uh, and I think it, it shows in the film <laughs> in a really positive way. That is hilarious. And the film, film, you know, it, you know, we talked about uh, critically being received well. We didn't mention all of the Oscars that it, it did win. It was nominated for nine Oscars, and it won for six of them: Best Picture, Best Director, which was the first um, time a woman actually won Best Director, uh, and I believe Catherine Bigelow was actually the fourth woman to have been nominated. The others were, uh, who were they? I had it here. I think it was. Uh, Lena Vertmuller uh, for Seven Beauties in 1976, Jane Campion for The Piano in 1993, and Sofia Coppola for Lost in Translation in 2003. That's the, so only four women have been nominated for Best Director, and Catherine Bigelow was the first to win. Uh, it also won, Mark Bull won for Best Original Screenplay, it won for Best Sound Editing, Best Sound Mixing, Best Film Editing, and then it lost, Jeremy Renner lost Best Actor to uh, Jeff Bridges, in Crazy Heart, it lost original score and it lost best cinematography. Do you think the Jeremy Renner, uh, Jeff Bridges decision was uh, the right one? Uh, you know, I love Jeff Bridges. And I, he was great in Crazy Heart. And he hadn't won an Oscar. And, I, you know, it's not like I want to say that, you know, it's a conciliatory sort of award for him because I thought he did a great job. But um, I just kind of felt it was Jeff Bridges' time, and you know, Jeremy Renner was the 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 new kid on the block. So it was it, his getting nominated was winning enough for him. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I I agree with that. Although you know, at it's at some you know sometimes you're watching that the watching him read the uh, response, and you just want you just wanted to go to the right guy. Just yeah. for the just for the portrayal of the film, no politics, no nothing. Because you're right, Bridges was great in Crazy Heart, I, he, absolutely. Uh, and and yet, uh, you know, we talked uh, last week about stories that really need to be told, and I think this is just you know here's here's one that needed to be told and was executed and uh, brilliantly, and the actors acquitted themselves brilliantly, and it was um, it was not only a joy to watch, it was painful to watch. It's an intelligent and muscular. Uh, movie about war insofar it is as it is uh, not a war movie uh it, it is a movie about what happens to people uh and and you know what people are able to do uh, in that environment and i i it was it's very moving it, it is um i you know i'm I mean, it's 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 always a tough pick. I mean, awards are always tough because I mean, it's the same year that George Clooney was up for Up in the Air, and Colin Firth in The Single mm -hmm. Man, and Morgan Freeman in Invictus. You know, mm -hmm. I see Invictus I is the I, I don't know Invictus, who I would have picked if I in, were voting. Invictus is the one that that would have given me trouble. I I never saw it. Um, oh, it was great, great. Yeah, I didn't hear it was very good. Oh, it so. was great. They're all wrong. <laughs> Bogus. But uh, yeah, you know, I you know the the award that stuck out for me was best score. I mean, I do think the music works well in the context of the film, which is probably why it was nominated. That being said, it's not a very listenable score. It's not something that you can put on and listen to it. It's by Marco Beltrami and Buck Sanders. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I because of that, I don't know if I would have felt that it was worth getting nominated. I think you know, Up won, and I think Up's score uh, by Mike, Michael Giacchino was definitely a stellar mm-hmm. score. Um, that guy, yeah, Michael Giacchino, he, he doesn't uh, doesn't do much wrong anymore. He's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but then you, know, you also had Avatar, James Horner, and Alexandre Desplat and Fantastic Mr. Fox, and mm-hmm. uh, Hans Zimmer and Sherlock Holmes. I, uh, you know, I felt Hurt Locker, uh, there probably were better films released that year that should have been nominated. And, and Hurt Locker, I, I, you know, it, to me, it felt like one of those awards that was just kind of thrown out that um, they were just at a point just kind of throwing more nominations their way when they really really didn't uh didn't deserve it i didn't think yeah you know that uh giacchino by the way space mountain did i tell you that oh i didn't know that he He, did the new space mountain music he he wrote the soundtrack to the new space mountain and you know what it is the incredibles (laughs) it's so good it's just like he does all the incredibles so it's not like he had to go uh, i know he didn't have to go go back to the well very very far for that one yeah Uh, all right I, uh, it's, yeah, I think you're right about the music though. Uh, Beltrami and Sanders. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Yes, right. yes. Uh, I, I think, uh, I, I think back to, uh, Catherine, I think I need to just, um, we need to, to go back to that well in particular. And, and this one I think is this, this may be, um, uh, the most important tweet, uh, in her tweet stream at Catherine A. Bigelow. April 9, 2012. Tip to directors. Your ego can only get you into trouble. Catherine Bigelow, April 9, 2012. Yeah, she's a deep one. She hasn't she doesn't actually tweet all that much. It's really disappointing. <laughs> really? I'm not going to lie to you about tell. it. It's really really disappointing. I I don't know if you've been able to pick up. I'm I'm really disappointed. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else uh, that you have on this one? I don't think so. Uh, you know, we've been going. This has been a long one. Yeah. It, well, you know, it's a good film. It yeah, warrants yeah. a good conversation. Uh, next, we're going to uh, hit her latest film that's just being released. We're going to go uh, see Zero Dark Thirty, and uh, I am very much looking forward to this one. It's going to be a. Uh, uh, it's going to be a great film. Now, does that open for you on the fourth? It opens tomorrow. I'm going to go see it. Uh, all right, all right, all right. I don't. I don't actually believe it op- uh, opens here yet, so I'm gonna have to wait another week. I think. That I'm gonna, sucks for I'm gonna you. check that out. Uh, but very excited to see this movie, and I, I'm also very excited to see, you know, the turnaround that has come from Catherine Bigelow because this movie, and with the, you know what I'm hearing about Zero Dark Thirty, um, you know, uh, this is a, a director with uh, hopefully, gosh, a lot more. Uh, to deliver to us in terms yeah. of really terrific films, and and finally, I think we're through, we're through all the other just nonsense, and now we can get to some real substance. Yeah, I think she's made a smart transition yeah. in her filmmaking career, and has found a way to take that action sensibility that she has and put it to use telling meaningful stories. Yep. So, mm-hmm. so one last thing to do. Yes, let's do it. All right, Hurt Locker or Panic Room. Hurt Locker. What? I know. I I have to read them. The Hurt Locker or Joe vs. the Volcano. <laughs> as far as watchability and, and how often I would put it in, I would vote for Joe vs. the Volcano. Yeah. But if we're voting on, on actual film quality, yes. I Locker. definitely am going to do Hurt Locker. Uh, you're totally right. Yeah. The Hurt Locker or All the President's Men. Boy, that's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. I I may have to say uh, the Hurt Locker just because you can hear everything that everyone says. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I'm going to pick the Hurt Locker too. All right. The Hurt Locker or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Hurt Locker. I don't I don't have to think very hard. I loved Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. But... See, I think I would go Eternal Sunshine. Are you serious? Are you on I, the yeah. fence about it? Because... I, I think that that one has really fascinating psychology, uh, you know, study of character and love and relationships. Uh, I, no doubt. I think I would pick Eternal Sunshine. But but would you, are you like on the spectrum? Are you just, I think I would kind of. No, I, I, I I, I'm it? saying I would pick Eternal Sunshine. 
So how do we do? We've never had to do a tiebreaker. I know what we, don't, that? we don't have a third voice in this. How do you even? I don't even know how to get to the other side of this. <laughs> All right. On the uh, count of three, I want you to punch yourself in the neck, and I'm going to do the same thing. And whoever whoever stands up first. <laughs> no. Uh, I don't know if that's going to work out. All right. I. You know. I. Um, I'm well, tempted... we'll, okay. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna, we'll, we'll, let's let's for now. It's the Hurt Locker oh. is already at number eight on our list. All above right, so it, you're going to say, "Let's for now. Let's just take mine." Because my vote, just for now, and I know we'll go back and redo it. Okay, just for that, we'll pick yours. <laughs> All right, the Hurt Locker. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. All right, the Hurt Locker or Jaws. <laughs> I'm going Jaws. I'm going Jaws. The Hurt Locker, or uh, oh no, that's it. It's it's number four on our. I chart. I feel good about number four. I think it should be number five. <laughs> 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 all right this is this uh this this may end up being the if this is our legendary dispute i'll take it <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> <laughs> we've been friends a long time but we're gonna die split on this <laughs> that's what i'm gonna write I'm gonna, actually i'm gonna write that on my uh on my tombstone <laughs> it was the hurt locker <laughs> no, I'll say just say number four sunshine. hurt locker <laughs> <laughs> Really awesome. Oh, that's grim. Hey, generations, generations from now, the kids will be going. They'll be what? doing gravestone rubbings <laughs> to try to solve the mystery. <laughs> what fueled this great debate? <laughs> <laughs> totally, I love it. All right, yeah. I got nothing else to talk to you about. No, I think we had a great time. We spoiled it thoroughly. Thoroughly spoiled. We stand by our conviction to spoil. Yes, yes. And uh, I'll catch you. Uh, I'll catch you next week, and we'll do uh, Zero Dark. I am very much looking forward to it. Good night, Andrew. Ciao. We wanted to take a moment to thank you for your continued support over the years. It's hard to believe that we've been having weekly in-depth discussions about movies since 2011. That's right. 12 years and counting. Producing this show is a labor of love for us, but it does require a lot of time and effort each week. If you enjoy our podcast and would love to help keep it going, there are some easy ways you can show your support. One is by using our Originals page to shop for the original source material that movies we've discussed were based on. That's right. In season one alone, we covered 13 films adapted from books or plays, from Charlie Kaufman's adaptation to David Fincher adaptations like Fight Club. In season two, we covered even more, like Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes and The African Queen from our series about legendary cinematographer Jack Cardiff. We can't forget about the four Jason Bourne movies we talked about. Love those movies. Well, the original trilogy, at least. <laughs> for our Richard D. Zanuck series, we did Jaws, Rush, Big Fish, and more. And for our horror series, we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing, which was adapted from Who Goes There? We did our first great car chase series with movies like Bullet, The French Connection, and Drive. And for the holidays, we did Preston Sturgis's Christmas in July. We had a great John Huston series with adaptations like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for our baseball series, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have I told you lately how much I love that movie? Uh, yeah, I think you have. Plus, our Magician series and Heist film series had adaptations as well tons of page to screen gems listeners can find the details and links to the original material at the next reel.com slash originals every book play or movie you buy through our links helps support the show and it's no extra cost to you so dive in and get your next read today the next reel.com slash originals has all the films adapted from other sources that not only we have covered but all of the shows on the next reel family of podcasts Check it out and get reading. Support the show and build your reading list. It's a win-win. Head to thenextreel.com slash originals.